Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar. The title of this webinar is Blow the Whistle, and it is a conversation on diversity and coaching, where we will be discussing embracing racial diversity and promoting unity in coaching. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, as a cultural, as the cultural event reminders, as this is a, an approved cultural event, please remember that in order to receive cultural event credit, Winthrop students must remain in attendance for the entire event, enable their webcams for the entire duration of the event, and remain in camera view. And you must not open a new web browser or otherwise minimize the Zoom video. Students are encouraged to participate in Q&A and discussion portions of the event. Zoom reminders. All participants are encouraged to participate in the webinar in a variety of ways. If you have questions, please use the chat feature. If your question has been asked, um, you can always just reiterate the question. To interact or respond to questions from the presenters, please use the chat feature. Please answer poll questions once displayed, and please complete the evaluation at the completion of the webinar, which will be sent via the chat function. Disclaimer. We are aware that during this program, we have centralized merely one component of diversity as it pertains to the theme and featured panelists. However, we recognize the importance to promote diversity across the exhaustive list of demographics that are the basis of inequalities and inequities across the world. Hello, my name is Lajay Reed and I'm a senior mass communication major and coaching minor. My athletic background is filled with a number of recreational sports. However, my most prominent sport experience was my time as a point guard at Timberland High School in St. Stephen, South Carolina. I played there for five years and grew to have a keen love for the game. And while I knew I wasn't going to play at the, le the next level, excuse me, I knew that I wanted to keep the sport close to me. Therefore, I have been striving to become a head coach um, in girls basketball, and I'm currently an assistant girls basketball coach at Rock Hill High School under the leadership of co Coach Keenan Orr. Hello, everyone. I am Joni Boyd. I am an associate professor of exercise science and coaching here at Winthrop University. I'm also the state director for the National Strength and Conditioning Association for South Carolina. I'm the coaching advisor for our uh, coaching minor program at Winthrop. And that is how Jay and I came to be able to put this event on. So I wanna take a moment and just thank the, um, my administration at Winthrop for supporting such an important event. And I wanna thank Jay for her very hard work in putting this event on. This was her independent study project. So she has worked on this event from start to finish and has been really um, diligent in getting this, uh, getting this to come to fruition. So if you guys don't mind giving her a big kudos when you see her, uh, that would be awesome. Um, I played softball in college and enjoyed a lustrous career and uh, just kidding on that. Uh, and now in, in enjoying working with um, students as they are engaged in learning more about coaching within our um, fields. We would like to take a moment to learn a little bit more about you. So if you can um, uh, complete the poll questions as you see them on the screen, we will start with question one. How would you best describe your current occupation? Please choose the best response, just one. Not many people are voting. There we go. Okay, I'm going to scroll to the next question. If you 
can complete that one and then we'll scroll to the next question. How would you, you describe your future occupation? Choose the best option, a coach of a sport at any level, training staff like athletic training, strength and conditioning, athletic administration, another position related to sports that may not be mentioned here or other. And then the final question, how much do you agree or disagree with the following statement? There's a strong value placed on diversity within my current situation, which could be your school or the occupation and where you work. All right, thank you. We have a strong response so far. I really appreciate that. I'll give you a few more seconds and let's check out our results. We have a large number of undergraduate students with us today, as well as um, individuals who will be related to sports in some way. And individuals agree or strongly agree that there's a value of diversity where they are. These are encouraging as we continue this conversation today. We will now take the time to welcome and introduce our panelists. Dr. Renee Miles Payne has been in athletic administration for 22 years and has worked at eight different institutions. Miles Payne, a native of Clarksdale, Mississippi, graduated from the University of Southern Mississippi in 1997, where she also competed in track and field. She received her Master of Education in Sports Administration in 2000 from Northwestern State and her EDD in Higher Education Administration from Pittsburgh in 2005. She is currently the Senior Associate Athletic Director for Administration and Chief Diversity Officer at the University of Miami in Coral Gables, Florida. Welcome, Dr. Renee. Dr. Ken Halpin is currently in his fifth year as Vice President for Intercollegiate Athletics at Winthrop University. Prior to Winthrop, he was the Deputy Athletics Director at Eastern Washington University. He has a BA in Exercise Science from Williamette University and an MA in Sport Administration from Gonzaga University and PhD in Education from Washington State University. Mrs. LaShonda P. Reed has been an educator for 25 years. She received a BS in Family and Consumer Science from Winthrop University in 1993 and an MS in Education from Winthrop in 1995. Reed would go on to receive an MS in secondary administration from the Citadel in 2011. Reed currently serves as one of two assistant principals at Timberland High School in St. Stephen, South Carolina. Three years ago, Reed took on the role of assistant principal of athletics, heading the Timberland Rules Athletic Department. Coach Brittany Cameron grew up in Dublin, California. She received a full scholar soccer scholarship to the University of San Diego, where she played for four years and graduated with a degree in communications. Her senior season, she was drafted to the National Women's Soccer League, a professional women's soccer league in the United States. After 10 years of playing professionally in the States and Japan, she retired and transitioned into coaching. She now is the assistant coach at Wake Forest University in the ACC. Taylor Smith is a certified strength and conditioning coach, personal trainer, and sport, for, excuse me, sport performance coach. Smith is currently an assistant strength and conditioning coach in Columbia, South Carolina. Smith received a BS in exercise science in 2019 from Winthrop University. Her love for strength and conditioning started back in high school when she was a multi-sport athlete. Coach Kennedy Tinsley is a Greensboro, North Carolina native and football standout at Dudley High School and the North Carolina Tar Heels. He played in the NFL with the Rams. He was the head football coach at Southeast Guilford High School in Greensboro, North Carolina before becoming the football coach, the head football coach at Mallard Creek High School in Charlotte, North Carolina. Coach Tim Boyd was a standout football player at Clover High School who went on to play college football at New Mexico Military Institute, Newberry College, and Guilford College. He has coached at the college and high school level for 10 years and led the Chester Cyclones to an undefeated season and the South Carolina 3A State Championship in 2018. He currently teaches special education at Mallard Creek High School and serves as the defensive coordinator for the Mavericks football team. 
We would like to welcome all of our panelists. And again, we would like to reiterate this disclaimer. We are aware that during this program, we have centralized merely one component of diversity. However, we recognize the importance to promote diversity across the exhaustive list of demographics that are the basis of inequalities and inequities across the world. Our webinar questions and responses will fall under the following categories cultivating diversity, roles of influence, standard integrity, promotion of unity, call to action, and moving forward. Workplace diversity research has increased over the last few years with a focus on multiculturalism, cultural intelligence, and cross-cultural diversity, showing that an awareness of diversity improves performance and relationships at work. As administrators, why is diversity among your colleagues and work groups so important in your leadership role? We will ask Dr. Renee, Mrs. Reed, and Coach Tinsley to please respond to this question. Hi, thank you, LJ and Dr. Boyd uh, for the opportunity to speak to, to the group today. So first and foremost, as a leader and a decision maker in, in athletics or in any, any, any industry, um, leaders must see value in diversity first. And so if, if so that's your, I guess, the, the first step. If value is not seen, then there won't be diversity, period. But if it is, if it is and it becomes vital to your, to your department or your industry or your institution, um, your culture is better. Your, the culture of your department is increased. Um, the team dynamics is, is better and multiple areas of diversity. So race, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, socioeconomic, um, thought, um, background, experience. If all of those things are found in the department spaces where you are or, or, or any industry where you are and it is vital to the leader and the decision makers, then your department will be will be great. Period. It just it just will be great. And and as a decision maker, I look for and identify those gaps in my team, and I try to do my best to diversify in all of those spaces to make sure that we hit the target and we hit the market. Because at the end of the day, you want to be successful. Mrs. Reed. Good morning. I'm getting there, Miss Reed. Um, I would just like to reiterate what Dr. Renee has shared, but I think one of the most important pieces is the intentionality of what we do. Um, she mentioned if an individual is not um, in agreement with or has a desire to support diversity, it can cause um, some challenges. So the intentionality of knowing the members of your team, knowing what they need in order to assist them in becoming more comfortable with um, diversity, despite what it is um, or what facet of diversity it is, um, that's the most important. Just being intentional about the planning, making sure that everyone's opinions are um, heard and appreciated as well as offering them an opportunity to share their variety of experiences as we try to move our team forward. Um, and I piggybacking off of what was already said, you know, I think um, as a leader, I think ultimately when you think about the world in general, um, the world is diverse. Um, it's full of different types of people uh, with different backgrounds. And in order for any organization to be successful, um, I think you have to relate it to the outside world. And so in that, um, great organizations are built on different people from different backgrounds that are willing to work um, together um, for, for one cause. And the more uh, diverse your organization can be, um, the, and then the more 
everyone is willing to work through their diversity, uh, I think the more impactful uh, the organization can be as far as the outside world, because your organization matches the reality of, um, of, of the world we're living in. Uh, and that comes with a lot of challenges because of the different backgrounds and beliefs. Um, but it's the ability to work through and overcome. I think we got a lot of people with sports backgrounds um, that are that are you know played on teams, and it's the same concept: the ability to work through and overcome um, each other's differences for one cause. Um, you typically create the most success. For others, why is diversity within your work groups so important for you as an employee? We will ask Coach Cameron and Coach Smith to please respond to this question. Yes, thanks for having me. appreciate you guys um, having me. Uh, diversity is, is just so important um, because you have to understand how people grew up, how they were raised. Um, in my sport particularly, it is not very diverse. Um, growing up in, in California is obviously super diverse, but then our microcosm of, of soccer, women's soccer to be specific, um, has its challenges. Um, so for me, the work environment, I am a little different and I look different. So being in, in soccer in that microcosm, um, I approach things differently. I talk differently. And so I think it's important that we diversify the work groups to understand each other and our differences. And I think that's the, the beauty is in the differences and not in the similarities to me. Um, I think for me, I really just want to give all the kids and athletes that I work with a safe space, you know, like um, there's a lot of different kids on different teams. And, you know, we keep talking about different cultural backgrounds and we want to make sure that everybody feels safe. Um, everybody feels safe. Everyone feels heard and cultural backgrounds. Everybody was raised different. So um, just kind of giving someone a safe space um, to be themselves, safe space to talk about things that might be a little bit hard uh, to talk about with others. So for me, I really just try to give those athletes that I work with someone that they can relate to, someone that looks like them, someone that looks like their mom um, or their sister, their family friend or something like that, something that they can relate to and they can feel like a safe space. Would any additional panelists like to respond to either form of the initial question? I, I piggyback off uh, Ms. Reed, Mrs. Reed. I like what she said uh, as far as intentionality. I think that's a huge uh, a part there is just uh, showing intentionality um, that you care um, about promoting diversity um, and just being intentional with other people um, just bring togetherness, uh, which, you know, uh, just creates that togetherness, that oneness atmosphere within a work, within a, a athletic football team or in a classroom. Uh, so just having that intentionality to meet someone or to know someone or know their name and then getting to know them who they are, that automatically breaks barriers. So that intentionality to know someone and for them to know you, then, you know, breaks that, that wall that it's not necessarily about differences it's more about you're my people because I know you and you know me so that intentionality part I think is huge I, and I would love to jump in um, th that that last question uh, I got a Dr. Miles so Dr. Miles how you doing uh, we uh, we worked together a few years here at Winthrop and that the way that last question reminded me we when when Renee was here we went through a very comprehensive strategic planning process. And, and we identified um, ways to, to become leaders in diversity as an institution. And she gets so much credit for the steps we took in that. But one of those steps is we created um, groups within our athletics department and assigned each of the group a collection of questions to talk about what, what are some objectives that could align with what we're aspiring to be as an institution. And we sat, I remember this day, we sat on a whiteboard right over here in my office and we drew up groups in our in our in our department of people who don't work together. So so they were heterogeneous groups by nature. So the women's basketball athletic trainer would be in a group with zero other women's basketball related staff members, where it's an academic person or or a strength and conditioning person. And so even just creating diversity in that little micro pro project that we had within the building, where people weren't 
used to working with each other, forced our staff to explore questions where they got to hear answers from people that, that live an entirely different life than they do, but inside the same building with the same mission, the same purpose. And, and we came away with a lot of feedback from our staff um, about how that was, uh, that was such a great eye-opening experience. And so creating awareness and constantly creating awareness that there are people impacted by your decisions who have lived experiences that are different than yours. That constant awareness is so essential. So that's my quick two cents. And then I got to throw out, I can't go forward without giving a shout out to a fellow Torero on the call, Coach Cameron. I, uh, I didn't graduate from USD, but I did go there my freshman year. I played football. Um, I wasn't good enough to play football and baseball, although I thought I was for a little bit. So I transferred to a Division three institution. So I just wanted to tell you that Shaney Fink says hello, and then I'll. Oh my it. gosh! Absolutely. <laughs> Yay! I love this. Go trails. Sorry. <laughs> Lack of ethnic minority women currently in leadership roles, job availability, and stereotyping of women in athletics are all common attributions for the lack of minority women who apply for and remain in athletic leadership positions. In your opinion, why are minorities, especially minority females, applying for leadership roles at a considerably lower rate even when qualified? How can this be addressed? We will ask Dr. Renee, Coach Cameron, and Coach Smith to please respond to this question. So first of all, I love this question because this is my wheelhouse. Like you know, I, I've been studying this for four for years. Um, there are two kind of schools of thought on, on this. And so um, we, we sit around the table and have these discussions, the women in this, in this profession. And some women are just tired, period. Let's just be real. There's no other, that's just a simple answer. Tired of rejection, tired of not being enough, tired of you know, me not measuring up, um, tired of not meeting the standard, um, tired of the daggum goalposts keep moving. That's just what it is, just tired. So why do I put myself through this ringer of trying to learn about these institutions, trying to interview and be what I know that they can't see? That's, that's, the, that's the dynamic that we work through. I'm trying to be what they can never see. So I can never put myself in a position to be that leader. So some get to that point and they're just tired and I'm not doing it anymore. So I will stay in my space or I will move out of the profession altogether and go somewhere else where I feel that I can be of value and, and, and need it. Then there's this other thought I live in this other thought. Um, you're not going to stop me. My will is, is, is greater than the challenge ahead. And so I'm going to be so good that you can't ignore me. Um, I'm going to bring my persistence and my greatness to you every day. So I, I, it's, it's a, if you remember the movie Shawshank Redemption, Redemption Andy Dufresne, kept chipping away at this wall with this little rock hammer, a little small little, little uh, uh, tool. And he had this beautiful poster of Raquel Welch over the, over the hole where he was doing it. But he kept hitting at that, rock, at that wall with that rock hammer and kept chipping away. And finally, he got out to freedom. That's in my head, that's who I'm going to be. I'm going to be Andy Dufresne. I'm going to keep chipping away. I'm not done. I might be the Joe Paterno of this thing and, 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 and dead in, 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 in the profession before I get there. But the goal is to keep chipping away at it. So the two schools of thoughts, some folks just tired, I'm done with it, not dealing with it anymore. I'm gonna cheer you on from the sidelines. And then there's others who are just going to be so persistent that they can't be stopped and their will is more important than the challenge ahead. Well, I'm going to state a little bit of a fact here and not to put myself on, but in, in women's soccer, there is only one black top assistant in all of power fives. And that is, it's so, it's sad to me. Um, and it's me. <laughs> so 
to think about it like that, I mean, especially in the sport that I, that I coach um, is really sad because it is women's soccer is 6% uh, um, black and one power five assist top assistant in the whole country. And there's zero head coaches in the power five. So in the big football schools, essentially. Um, and I think for, for me, it's women just, we decide, oh, you know, we're gonna be, we're gonna be less than, and we don't wanna power through. And, and our voice sometimes gets shot down or just play your role, it's okay. You be happy with what you have. Um, and I decided, no, I'm not gonna be happy with what I have. I'm gonna prove it first on the field. I'm gonna prove it. <laughs> I'm gonna prove it over and over and over again. And then I'm gonna ask for what a man asked for. And I'm gonna come in there and I'm gonna show you things on paper. I'm gonna show you what I've done. Um, and I think having that attitude and I tell like our kids, hey, this is who I am and this is what I bring. I let them know, I'm not quiet about it because I want them to be just as confident when they go into their world and their world might not be coaching. Their world could be at Twitter or you know, anywhere, doctor, everything, PAs. Um, but I want the women that come through this program to see strong black women leads. And that's what I preach to them every day. No, you have to be strong. You ask for what you deserve and you ask questions. Um, I think sometimes as women, we, well, we'll just accept the answer. Well, I wanna know why, <laughs> why not? Why can't I do this? If he's this, why can't I have this with a better resume? Um, so I think like, like you just said before me, Dr. Renee, just powering down those doors um, with confidence um, and, and reassurance that, you know, you are good and you have to have a, some self-talk every day. I am this, I'm bringing this to the table and I know what I bring to the table and I make sure my kids understand what they bring to the table just as what I bring to the table as well. So they can be powerful women when they leave, leave our university. I don't even know how to come back after two strong women like that, you know, but I mean, you know, just kind of being, being the younger one in the group and entering this field, I'm noticing like, there's no one that looks like me in this field. I have just met my first black female strength coach and she was in college, Corliss Fingers at Bethune Cookman in college. And I've been at strength and conditioning for some years now. And I've, I've yet to meet a black woman in the high school sector. I only know of myself and that alone is why I've believed that some people don't even know that these positions exist for us. They keep seeing the same faces over and over and over in these positions. And so, yeah, they're afraid to apply. Like, I don't see anyone that looks like me, but what I am learning as I am getting into this and going to different jobs and talking to different people is that like, you're not just gonna check off a box. I don't, I don't just meet two boxes for you. I don't just meet African-American. I don't just meet a woman. You're not gonna check off two diversity boxes just by hiring me here. And like they said, I'm a bust through this door. Like I'm, I'm here, I'm the black woman that you hired and I'm gonna be who I am. And you either accept it or I'm gonna show you why I'm the best. Like they said, I'm gonna show you why I'm the best. <laughs> And then I'm gonna make my decision as to what I'm gonna do next. You know, like is that move forward? Is that stay here and help you guys change? Whatever that looks like for that um, for that time period. But I'm not just gonna check off two boxes. And I think sometimes when you wanna put people in those leadership roles, you know, like they say, they kind of just feed you and just saying, you should just be happy with what you have. And it's like, no, like I didn't do all this hard work over all this time to just be happy because I checked off a box for you and I'm the first this and I'm the first that. Like, no, I'm here to make a change, here to make a difference. And so for me, like, I mean, it all makes sense as to why we're not applying, but I want people to know that you can, you will, and you should, like, go for it. Mentors and coaches have an important role in the development of athletes and or aspiring coaches. The influence of a coach or mentor can be both positive and negative and can be directly related to the self-value perceived by the mentee. How valuable are coach influences in developing coaching diversity among a sport or across an institution? And we will ask that, uh, Coach Cameron and Dr. Halpin to answer. Oh, it's, it, this is, I love this question. Um, I actually just had an experience. I think it, I just had an experience the other day with one of our athletes um, who is not an athlete of color. Um, 
And I think that is so much just as valuable to teach athletes of non-color about our experiences as women of color. Um, and I hold that almost a bit more um, in regard to, hey, this is me, this is why I am this way, right? I take it more as a, a learning tool to help these young athletes of non-color um, in order to show, hey, these are my experiences and they're not gonna be yours, but here's how you can be an ally and help. Help us, help your friends, help your family understand. And if I can teach the athletes of non-color something or show them who a woman of color is in a position of power, I think that's gonna spread and be infectious throughout the world. Um, and that's, I love that part of it. And then the second part is showing athletes of color that there are people of power that look like them, that go through the hair, same hair struggles or go through the same, they're allowed. Um, you know, I get more questions from my students like, coach, what hair products do you use? Or coach, where'd you get your nails done? I value that just as much as I ask, you know, coach, how do I save this shot? I value those things just as much. Um, and I think it's so important for, for our girls of color to see how we handle ourselves um, in positions of power. So they have something to aspire to. I didn't have anybody, I didn't, wasn't coached by a woman, let alone a woman of color. Um, and I think I remember my younger self, my crazy younger self in California. I know that if I would have had that, maybe I would have been on a better track um, because they would have understood what I was going through at a time when not a lot of people understood what I was going through, especially being in soccer. I'm more of a, let's say a basketball story than, than a woman's quote unquote, which we all think of women's soccer stories, you know? Um, so I think nice. understanding those those struggles um, for our students of color. And I share some of my story and I think it's important. Now, I think it's important that I share that story um, with, you know, not growing up with a father. I think it's important for kids to, to know that. And that doesn't, that goes across all, um, all students, not just, you know, black, white, Asian, we all go through those struggles. So I think it's important as people in positions of power to share that so our kids and our youth can learn from that. I love, I love what Coach Cameron just shared and it actually reminded me, uh, you'll have to forgive me going back. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, Dr. Miles gets a lot of credit for my growth and no different than Coach Cameron talked about having a conversation with a white student athlete. You know, it's not just coaching down, sometimes it's managing up. And, and when, when Renee and I work together, from the from her interview, literally, and we 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 she and I have told this story several times. Not, Thirty minutes into our interview, the entire conversation was about race, and she taught me that it is safe with her to talk uh, vulnerably and have questions and and to risk being wrong. And I also learned from Dr. Miles the 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 great weight on anyone of color to at times feel a sense of having to educate white people. Like that's exhausting, and and. Following the George Floyd incident, I, I got a sense from a lot of people that became unbelievably exhausting. So that there, there became a responsibility and, and through my friendship with Renee and through others in our department, I began to realize my responsibility to pursue learning and, and have to, to find other ways to learn, not just through dialogue um, <clears throat> because of how important it is. And so uh, that, that's kind of the example that came to mind for me. And then you know, the other example I will say is, is something that we've talked a lot about at Winthrop is, is we actually, we believe that we have two responsibilities. One responsibility is to constantly be aware of creating diverse candidate pools so that then the strongest candidate has the greatest opportunity to be a diverse candidate so that we can influence the makeup of our department. It is important that, the, or that our department makeup uh, in some way mirrors the makeup of our student athletes. That, that, that's, that's where we look to mirror, but there's another layer. And um, if you're going to come through one of our searches and be one of the strongest candidates, one of the things I, I'm gonna be looking for is do you understand your role, not just in influencing the makeup of our department, but do you understand your role and how you can impact the diversity of our industry as a whole? 
And that that's one of the things like, you know, Dr. Miles and I, you know, we, we keep in touch. Like our reward for hiring her was losing her to Miami. You know, she she hit a huge springboard. And now, um, you know, and and I would encourage, especially the women on the call, go back in time and listen, listen to that speech that Renee gave and listen to the, the strength in her voice. Um, that did not come through success that came through all the walls that she's hit up against and overcome and she's hit more than 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 most people that i know and never quits she never quits um and and i don't want that to be lost in all of this conversation i think that's a, undergrads on this call when you're looking for mentorship uh, and i forgive me renee i'm going to tell them all to call you and build build that relationship with her because she has connected herself so well in this industry and overcome so much she has the stories and the encouragement that you can hear. But back to what I was going to say about our department. So, so I'll give an example. When we went to hire a volleyball coach, the, the strongest candidate in our pool happened to be a white male. And so we hired Chuck Ray. But part of the reason he was such a strong candidate is because he, without prompting, communicated his understanding of his role and how he can influence volleyball. Not Winthrop, volleyball collegiate volleyball across the country. Fast forward, his first two assistant coach hires were minority females. Within two years, both of them were interviewing for head coach jobs. And by the end of his second year, by the way, he was coach of the year two years in a row, his first two years. He was absolutely the best guy for the job. But his lead assistant, a minority female, after his second year, got hired as a head division one volleyball coach. And for those of you that, that don't really know the, the, the world of intercollegiate athletics, if you're a mid-major institution, a mid-major assistant coach getting a division one head coaching job is almost unheard of. And so him understanding and embracing his role, and, and I don't know that he would like the word mentor because she didn't need mentorship, but, but he got the opportunity to help guide her and give her those opportunities. And then she went and earned it. And, and that, that's the, what, what Coach Ray was so good at uh, contextualizing during the interview process that helped me see that even though if we hire this white male, then, you know, our, 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 our makeup as a department maybe doesn't take a step forward in, in diversity, but our influence on the industry takes a massive leap forward because he understands what we're trying to stand for. And, and so that's what I would say is, is all coaches can understand their impact on the industry, regardless of their background. But that means being willing to have these conversations wide open, not being afraid to get it wrong and working with your teammates to figure out how to get it right. How has a coaching influence developed your ability to positively affect others within your profession? And in respect of time, we're going to ask uh, just Coach Smith to answer this question um, so that we can continue to progress forward. Um, I think, like I said, like I just met Coach Fingers for Bethune Cookman and like you said, just kind of talking to women that have power through have just made things so much clearer as I'm stepping into things. And um, it's these conversations, you know, like Halpin said, you know, it's just these conversations, talking with people that have already broken the barriers, talking with people who have already uh, had these conversations with their athletes, like Coach Cameron said, having these conversations with people opening the door allows me to take those conversations to my athletes and have those same conversations. So um, I'm very big on having conversations. So I'm gonna, of course, you know, I, after this call, talk to all these coaches on here. Um, but you take what they've told you, you, you know, swallow it, you apply it to your own life and then you pass it on because kids are watching right? Like our athletes are watching, our kids are watching and what we're doing and how we go about our things in our daily lives affects them as well. So I want to make sure that I also have taken the influence that someone has put into me and put it into those kids that I'm talking to, because I too want them to have that same, whatever it is that they want to do, I want them to go do it. I don't want them to feel like they have any kind of thing holding them back, whether it's skin color, whether it's uh, sexuality, whether it's your gender, I don't want any of that to show through. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take in what I've been learning from, you know, of course, this call and other coaches, I'm going to take that, put that into my life. Okay. Marinate on that in my life and then pour that into those kids. Cause it's the same thing. You know, we're just singling diversity here in this one conversation to all the panelists, but diversity opens up to a lot of different things, um, out there. So just trying to put that into the kids. Um, 
you know, and hopefully that puts that into other coaches. The more you have these conversations with other coaches, the more that we're forced to sit down, talk about it and really make people get comfortable being uncomfortable. You know, like I'm big on that. Like <laughs> make, this has been one year where everyone's had to be uncomfortable. So make people get comfortable being uncomfortable, have these conversations, be that influence for those kids and just let them know that diversity can be in any position. We just have to show them that it's there and hopefully I can be that coach or just help some other coach that can show those kids the same thing. I want to apologize and retract my earlier statement and um, ask Coach Tinsley if he will please respond to this question. We would love to have your insight. Oh, thank you. I felt so neglected, you know. No, I appreciate it. Um, I, I think uh, there's a number of coaches that I've worked for that have um, that have influenced me. Um, and uh, and I really I thought about what Ken said. Um, at one point, I was the only African American on a high school coaching staff, um, and uh, I don't think the head coach really considered or thought about like I need more African Americans. I think he was trying to get the best coaches in which he had access to and felt comfortable with um, with hiring, um, but. Ultimately, that experience, him giving me that opportunity and that experience um, helped me understand the importance of diversity, um, right? And so uh, I think that in itself really helped me as an African-American say, you know, when I hire staff, I don't want an all African-American staff um, because I know what that feels like. And I think sometimes as minorities, we think about it one way, but not necessarily the other. Um, we can actually do the same thing um, that's essentially that we're fighting against. Uh, and so I, I just think that's really important, uh, especially amongst the culture and group of people that you're working with. Um, it gives kids a chance to see diversity, which encourages them to be a part of um, diverse uh, cultures and, 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 and organizations and things that um, they can do. So. Uh, that that uh, opportunity really impacted me uh, today. The NFL Rooney Rule was adopted in 2003, requiring every team with a head coaching vacancy to interview at least one or more diverse candidates. Are diversity standards like the Rooney Rule truly promoting inclusivity or an implementation of protocol? These standards and principles are often enacted retrospectively. How can we move to being universally proactive in the promotion of diversity and inclusion? Um, I think at, at the Rooney Rule at this point, and some people have the uh, opinion that it's a joke. Um, I think any step towards progress, you know, I mean, it is a step, you know, and so you have to look at it that way. Um, I know a lot of people would even check the box of the Rooney Rule with a phone call. You know, they might call a coach and say, hey, you know, ask some questions and then check that as, a, as, a, uh, as an interview. Um, so I think it is somewhat progress, um, but it's definitely, you know, we definitely are looking forward to more. Um, and, and I think in some ways things have progressed since 2003. Um, and there, there are definitely tons of room for improvement. Um, but I think uh, ultimately it's the sincerity of uh, what's trying to be done and, and working towards uh, truly, truly giving people an opportunity um, so that we can build the diversity. And I think you, you won't get that until you understand the importance of it. When you understand the importance of it, then comes the sincerity and saying, hey, uh, we want a more diverse culture. We want the best person for the job, you know, um, but we still want and understand the importance of a diverse culture and giving people opportunity. And there's a there's a tough balance of that sometime, uh, but it, I think it just comes down to being sincere. Um, and, and sometimes when we're in the positions we're in, um, we don't look at, we don't have the sincerity of, of, of when we interview someone and 
um, and hiring someone and giving people opportunities. But uh, it is really important to the culture of our our nation, but the culture of the uh, the organizational school that you work for. So I I was really excited when I saw this question in the agenda because I think it's I think it's such an important topic, and so it reminds me of something uh, a professor I had in college said, and I will never forget it. And I'm not going to share this because I think it is accurate or inaccurate. I'm going to ask everyone on this call to consider it and decide for yourself if you think it is accurate or inaccurate. But I think it stimulates so much thought. And that was this. He said, in the history of the world, true social change has really only happened in one of two ways, legislation or revolt. And I always think about that. And I don't, I, I'm not saying if it's true or not, but if you think about it, th this is a social topic. Are we, are we investing time giving talented minority candidates a shot at jobs? And it, that social change wasn't just happening. And so the NFL pursued legislation and, and, and people can question it and that's fine. But it's like, we, we talk about it in Winthrop all the time on anything like uh, it shoot, like even with my kids, when I want my kids to do something, at the end of the day, it's like, Jonathan, I don't want you to clean your room. I want you to want to clean your room. You know what I mean? Like that's that's the goal in, in leadership. I, I don't I don't. So here, I don't want you to interview a diverse pool. I want you to want to interview a diverse pool. And until we get there, then legislation is our our next best option. So so I, I'm of the opinion that it's it's not perfect. No one, no one agrees that it's perfect, but you know what? It wasn't just going to happen. So, so until, until discussions like this become not new, like until discussions like this become something that happened in the hallway because it's important and not because Jay did so much work to try to prepare a really robust conversation with people, if that makes sense. So, so I personally I think it's 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 like it's the best we got until there are more and more people rising to leadership positions that not only agree to to pursue a diverse pool and pursuing a diverse candidate pool is not posting a job. Pursuing a diverse candidate pool is asking people like I'll say today, and, and you guys probably know this. Um, we're we're in the middle of a men's basketball search here at Winthrop. Um, if you go back in time to when, when Renee was here, we did a lot of work to, to demonstrate that we wanna be leaders in diversity. And that gave our department, I'm confident today, we have a reputation of being leaders in diversity. So with this search, our pool, um, and, and really the pool that we took seriously was over 50% minority. And that might be the first time we got there, not because we were looking for it, but because it came and found us. And I give, I give that credit to the people who came before today, who helped us have these conversations and proactively pursue more diverse pools by in, in, including people because, because that's, the, that's the most important key, create a diverse candidate pool so that the strongest candidate has the best opportunity of being a diverse candidate. So, so that, that's my perspective is I just think un, until, until our leaders want this, I'm all for legislating it. I, I agree, Ken. I mean, so, the Rooney, uh, an example is the Russell rule in the West Coast Conference. Um, right now, if you're watching basketball, Gonzaga is was the number one overall seed and they play in that conference. Um, the commissioner of that conference is a Hispanic female who went to all the presidents and said, we need to move this forward. And they were the first ones out the box with saying, the Bill Russell rule, because he played at a school in that conference, that's what they named it. And it's going to happen with any high level positions within that conference, head coaches and athletic directors. The ACC is looking at the same thing. I sit on a committee that is looking and intensely looking at how this can be implemented in a way that makes folks comfortable because that is that is true they still people still need to be comfortable and so my voice on the committee is this if we wait on people to do the right thing we're going to be disappointed so let's hit where it really matters 
Everybody understands one thing universally, money. Can we show how this economically impacts an institution, a school, a program? Let's get down to the nitty gritty and deal with what really matters. And, and let's be real, we, we work in athletics, hey, we cheer it, but look, bro, this is about money. How can we get them to see that this diversity economically in, in, in influences how you look as an institution? University of Miami has over 80% black males on the football team. We make money. <laughs> because those guys are competing. They need more coaches that look like them in those positions to help them achieve what they really want to achieve. So that's how we want to have to move. And we can't do that unless there is something in place legislatively to help move that forward. So we can't wait for people to be like, well, we just don't do the right thing because it's not, we're not going to get there. You can't, you can't legislate the heart. You're waiting for people's heart to change. That ain't happening. So you have to hit them where it, where it, where it matters. And right now, money, capitalism, we're a capitalistic society. That's where, it, where we have to look at it and, and show how it can change. Thank you. The lack of minority coaches also may affect what players do when it comes to political protests. The coaches have a major influence on how members of a team respond to adverse events. The value of diversity, excuse me, diversity has been challenged by various events just over the last 12 months. This has led many athletic teams to push towards embracing diversity and promoting unity. How are you using diversity to promote unity among your players and coaches? We will ask Coach Cameron and Coach Tinsley to answer. Yeah, I, um, I'm on the ride committee um, and, and so is our head coach. Um, in the ACC, our head coach is, is a Spanish uh, Mexican uh, man um, and, and me in the ACC, which is in women's soccer is a bit of an anomaly to be completely honest. So I think that for just props to Wake Forest as far as um, pushing the culture forward, um, putting us on a committee um, to ensure that our student athletes understand um, what their coaching staff is like and who we are as people. Um, I think that is so important. Um, just the other day, our girls, you know, our coaches, about it's California as they, um, they come, if you can gather what that means um, by his views. Um, and so we, he wears a BLM hat. Um, again, I'm a black female. So our, our girls are constantly surrounded um, in, in hearing these topics that we talk about on the daily. Um, and so I think our head coach has been really amazing at, at promoting um, all of the things as far as whatever you are, whoever you are, to be who you are and be the verse, best version of you, whether that's a black female, a white female, uh, whatever your sexual orientation is female, and it is accepted in our microcosm um, to be you and be you unapologetically. And so I, I'm just, and so actually the other day we have an Asian girl and, and a, uh, a white girl came up and said, we wanna create shirts coach, can we make that happen? Two days later, we're wearing equality shirts. Um, so I'm proud that our kids are seeing our culture push forward and that they're taking the initiative to create and push that culture because they see what we've created meaning our head coach and myself created this culture that, hey, we're, we're here, we're accepting this. This is our standard here. And we want other, we want our kids to follow and push. And so I was really proud of that. And I think that we've been doing a great job. And, and yes, like um, Dr. Renee said, doing a great job is great, but at the end of the day, it's about results. Um, let's not forget why we're here. We're here to win. Um, and I think creating that culture, we've gone from, being pretty average here in the, the ACC. And right now, you know, we're beating with, uh, NC State. So I think that creating that culture is also pushed the ultimate goal and why we're here. Let's not forget, we are here to win soccer games, right? Or we are here to win football games. So again, back to that, I, I'm pretty proud of what we've been doing and we're gonna set and continue to push that culture forward. Uh, for my 
self, I think um, it started with building a staff, um, getting coaches on our staff that um, have diverse backgrounds that um, look different um, and, and have different experiences. And then from there, I think hiring a staff uh, that is diverse, it should trickle down into the rest of your team um, based off of your willingness to work to, uh, together, um, to the willingness to talk about things that uh, might be uncomfortable at times, um, uh, but being, uh, uh, you know, uh, I guess making a point to speak on diversity and the things that's going on in our country and our nation. Uh, and a lot of times it's very easy to overlook those things and focus on ball. Uh, but those things are a critical part of the development of our kids. Um, and so uh, bringing that out and talking about it and then relating the talks to what they're seeing, I think truly, truly makes an impact. Um, I think we also have a number of speakers come in um, and, and we do the same. I mean, we have uh, people from different backgrounds that look different, uh, uh, that have different experiences, talk to our kids. Uh, and all those are like little doors that open up for their experiences um, that I hope will help impact them in the future of their careers um, as, as we continue to try to give them those kind of opportunities. And we would like to also ask Coach Boyd if he would respond to this question as well. Yeah, uh, just piggybacking off what uh, Coach Tinsley said, you know, work uh, for him. Um, just, again, creating that, that diverse environment with our coaching staff. Um, and I think, uh, like, for our players, just to see us coaches, and we all have different backgrounds and how we're able to come together, work together, uh, and see how we work and, and enjoy it and, 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 and uh, delivering that to the players, I think that promotes it as well. Thank you all. So now moving forward, moving forward, how does the vision of diversity impact the future of coaching? We would like all the coaches to respond, starting with Coach Smith, all by Coach Boyd, and then in the next order. More coaches, right? I, I get excited to see more coaches, more coaches that look like me, that look like everyone in this call, more, right? And, um, just breaking down the door. Uh, like I said, I, I have yet to meet someone that looks like me at the high school sector. I, I've yet to do it. And I would love to see more, but until my kids see me there, they don't know that they too can be there at the high school sector. And I mean, I'm not opposed to anything else, but I said like, they need to see it. So for me, diversity, when you have athletes at such a young age, that's the key time to catch them. That's the key time to begin to start making a change not only in the athletic world, that's society, right? Like we're seeing things happen in society every day. And that's the time is to have those conversations. And maybe they were raised in a way that's not so favorable to, you know, this conversation, right? But they're around a coach, a black coach, they're around a Hispanic coach, they're around someone of a different sexuality. And they're just like, well, they're not as bad as everyone else in the world is making it seem, right? So now we're opening the conversation. Now they're beginning to expand their mind to different ways. So I think I think we're headed in the right direction. More of us in the door, more people of different backgrounds in the door um, begins to change the conversation. Um, hopefully we can change the heart, you know, a little bit there, hopefully change the heart of the kids at the young age. But, um, you know, like I said, just starting to get people in the door so they can see that like I too can be right here one day. I, I agree with you, Coach Smith. Um, Coach Tinsley, he does a really good job of, again, promoting diversity with our team and, and, and giving, allowing speakers to come and speak and then showing clips, clips that relate to our team and just where we are in our journey. And so we saw a clip yesterday of a, a Batman movie, and it was uh, like the, the Dark Knight Rises. I can't remember which one, but, you know, Batman, he escapes from this prison. And once he escapes, he throws the rope back down. Right. And so after he escaped, he threw the rope back down for everyone else to be able to get out. And I think just looking at that yesterday and just thinking about that topic, I mean, that's exactly how we have to move forward. You know, as each one of us uh, continuously move and progress in our careers and knowing those things, doing uh, webinars like this and then giving back 
and throwing the rope back, you know, giving other people opportunities, exposing everyone uh, to the challenges that we face on a daily basis to try to, uh, to try to promote more diversity within the coaching field and athletics. So I think, um, you know, being able to throw the rope back down and being able to help and just small tid, uh, just my coaching experience when I first started, um, uh, it, it was a little different. Uh, a lot of African-American coaches that were older uh, really didn't uh, give me a lot of chance. You know, I got, I got some opportunities from, of uh, some white coaches, some white male coaches who actually uh, taught me some things and allowed and gave me some ropes uh, until I was able to progress my career. And then I was able to, you know, meet more diverse people and help me along. But I, I noticed at that time, in my early career, guys wasn't trying to pass the rope down. It was kind of like a tight secret of, of how to move forward. And I was kind of, that was frustrating, you know, seeing it from people that looked like me that just really wasn't trying to pass the rope down. Uh, but now, I mean, I see that now uh, with with mentors and, and guys like Coach Tinsley. But I think that's the key, man. Once you we see that, we realize that being able to pass the rope now. Would any other coaches uh, on our panel like to respond to this question? Sure, I'll jump in real quick. Um, I decided I've been in charge of heading our um, our speaker series. And I think for me, when I was younger, I didn't see a lot of people of color in positions or jobs that were not just about sport, but maybe, you know, everyone says lawyers and doctors. Well, what if I don't want to be a lawyer and doctor? I think it's super important. So I've made it a point to um, reach out to some of my friends that are not, that did not play sports, but that are women of color in different sectors, such as sorry, I'm from California. So Twitter, Uber, all of those type of things, Airbnb, and to bring in, to bring those people in to speak to our young women, because again, back to that, the students of non-color to see women that are high powering jobs that are not just doctors and lawyers, because that's not everyone. Um, and to show them, hey, that these are people of color and they are in great positions and they are making just as much money as doctors and lawyers, especially in California that's another subject, but they're doing amazing work and things that you use every day. I think that's so important. So I actually am getting one of my friends, a couple of my friends from either Airbnb or Twitter in, um, in diversity and inclusion to speak to our girls so that the people, the, the student athletes of non-color can see, oh my gosh, I remember back when I was younger and I was at Wake Forest and our coach brought in a black woman who is in charge of Twitter at Blackbirds or Airbnb diversion and inclusion. So I think that's just as important as bringing former athletes, but to see women of color in different positions, not just sport. Um, and then also helping our student athletes of color to get internships. Um, so I'm helping one of our goalkeeper become a coach. Um, so she's going to intern and she going through it yesterday with me about how to, how the interview process is going to work. But I think that's just as important as me coaching her on the soccer field is helping her give back to the community, um, whether it's the youth or whether she doesn't want to coach ever again, but she's definitely going to give back in, in some form. So I think that's super important. Yeah, um, I think the diversity can, uh, I mean, truly, truly in coaching, truly, truly make an impact in our world. Um, so many African Americans, uh, whites. I mean, it don't matter what what race have been impacted by sports. Um, and uh, Renee spoke about money earlier. I mean, uh, athletics uh, is a huge business um, in the in the college world and professional world. And that uh, platform can be a, a great way um, to impact our world. And as we get more um, diverse leaders added into the culture of those organizations. Um, I also think it's really, really important um, that we uh, make sure that we're doing a great job. You know, uh, I think there's a number of people that will get on and say, I want to knock down a door and be this. Um, but only a few people truly, truly um, work their craft um, to the point where they're constantly going to not be denied and not give up, um, not be discouraged. Um, and, 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 and truly be productive. 
right? Um, because it's one thing to want an opportunity, um, and then it's another thing to be productive and show that, hey, I deserve this job, not because we need more of a certain race or culture or um, uh, in, in the job or whatever. I mean, you're, you're really good at what you do and you're going to bring results. Um, and so uh, working at that and then continue to support each other. Coach talked about passing the rope down, um, regardless of, of, of your race um, is, is really important. Um, Cause that's what it's ultimately about, right? It's really ultimately about um, impacting, creating change um, in people. Uh, and and the, when the Lord blesses you with an opportunity, I mean, there's an expectation that you should be blessing others. Um, and so by doing that, we can really, really create um, change. And when we do it the right way through love, um, naturally um, it will become all our stuff, our teams, our schools will become more diverse. Um, when it's done through love. Moving forward, how does the vision of diversity impact the future of administration? Administrators starting with Mrs. Reed. Well, um, let me just say or back up just a little and say that probably of all the panelists, I'm probably the non-traditional panel member um, not having a coaching background, um, but having the opportunity to participate or lead our athletics department. Um, so there must have been some type of quality or qualities that I possess that um, my employer saw it um, necessary to have me serve in this role. And so when I consider the challenges as the leader or the administrator and not having that coaching background, I also begin to think about my responsibility, um, as we said, as being first um, a minority, second being a woman, um, but then ultimately um, knowing that as um, I think it was Coach Smith who said, someone's watching. And then Coach Tinsley came back and said, um, remember, as well as Coach Boyd says, you know, throw the rope and bring someone else along with you. So it's very, very important that I do my job well. And so I feel that pressure on a daily basis, but for me, it's a good pressure. I don't want to only be the influence for those who look like me. I want to be an influence for all student athletes. And in an effort, and coaches, and in an effort to do that, um, I'm going to be intentional about the plans that I have um, moving forward with my team. And also knowing who I put myself in the place with those around me. It's gonna be very, very important that as we move through these processes that we have individuals and we are able to make the contacts and connects in order to make this what we would consider the norm and not something that we feel like has to be a specific conversation to try and overcome uh, in terms of having those who might look different than what currently stands as the norm. And so I appreciate, um, I think it was Coach Houston who said, um, making sure that we have that diverse pool to select from. Um, and also when you're doing those things, again, with that intentionality, then others will want to be a part of that group or be a part of that institution. And so if um, we continue to work hard in each of our positions and bring others along, I think we will be able to um, meet the challenges that are set before us. I was just hesitating to let Renee go first, but if you're gonna wait, I'll go next. No, I didn't know. I didn't, my name didn't show up, so I didn't talk. Yes, ma'am. You, 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 you know how I follow instructions, Ken. You know I follow instructions. <laughs> so here, here's all I'll say. Um, I'll be quick. This, the future 
of diversity in our industry is everybody's responsibility. But I will say it can't necessarily be from the voice of someone like me. It's got to be from the voice of everyone and someone like Renee's voice has to be elevated. So I'm going to take something Renee said earlier and I, and I, and I'm going to, then you can't say it again, Renee, you, you got to say something else, but I don't want anybody to miss Stop this. Stealing. This is the most important piece. And Renee said it. Do not quit. Do not give up. I don't care if you try and you get crapped on a million times, you wipe yourself off and you go for a million and one. I don't care how many times it's been, you do it again. The beauty of the future is the sun is going to come up again tomorrow. So if you still got oxygen in your lungs, you can still keep fighting. And that's the only thing I'll say. And I want to reiterate, I'm just stealing it from Renee. I'm glad you went first then. Because basically what's going to happen is that we have to have allies and co-conspirators in this thing. And, and Ken is not just and an ally, an ally, that ally is a noun. We need verbs. Ken is a verb. Ken is a co-conspirator. Ken is a person who is who has the look of the person in power. These are the people who are making the decisions. So let's just be real, real clear. White men sit in the positions of power in most of these places, in athletics specifically. We have to have them act as allies and co-conspirators to get this thing moved and changed. And so they have to say, okay, I recognize my privilege and I'm gonna use my privilege for power and use that power for good. That's where it heads. So they have the privilege and they have the power. Everybody's not gonna use it for good. So what we're looking for is more people who are going to use that power that they have for good. And so when we have more Ken Halpins, when we have more Joe Colgards, and I'm just naming people off the top of my head that I know, uh, um, Greg Burns at the Alabamas, when we have more of those people sitting in those seats who are willing to use their privilege with the power for good, things will change in, in diversity within athletics. How do we use the value of diversity to promote unity in the future, even beyond race? And we would like to begin with uh, Coach Boyd. Um, let me read that again. So how do we use value of diversity to promote unity in the future? Um, I think it goes back to what Ms. Reed said uh, in the very, very beginning. And I think I piggybacked on it earlier is that intentionality piece. Um, again, just being intentional in our approach of, of, of connecting with others. Uh, Coach Tinsley talked about it, just uh, the, the heart factor of love. And um, I think that's a, the ultimate factor um, in when we are intentionally engaging with other people that would only promote unity, you know, within the future. So um, uh, just our int intentionality and in interacting with other people, I believe will, um, will value the diversity, promote unity. Any additional panelists who are um, wanting to respond may respond at this time. I would just say if, if are there any Steelers fans on the call? Like, so, so I'm in the mall, walking in the mall before COVID, got on a Steelers shirt, people pass you, here we go, here we go. I don't know these people, they don't know me. But we've rallied around a common cause and a common vision of we are Steelers fans. We love the Steelers. When everybody gets to the place where we can rally around a common cause, common vision, be a great country, be a great athletic department, or be a great team, or whatever that common cause is, we can all rally around it, no matter what color you are, no matter where you, where you sit at the socioeconomically, where you sit. Uh, sexual orientation wise, where you sit religious wise, doesn't matter what your background experience is. If we can come to that conclusion that we rally around this common cause, 
it, it, it'll be it'll be great. We'll all be in a diverse place and we will you know be able to hold hands with you know with our brothers and sisters and not have the fear of anything happening that, that we'll, we'll be okay with each other. So rally around that common cause. I would like to jump in here as well. I think it's as critical, uh, we have this conversation set aside for coaches, but I think we could have the exact same conversation with educators. Uh, I think those individuals who lead others, who motivate others, who influence others, who educate others um, are just as critical in this um, link of learning more about each other as, as coaches. And so I would um, you know, like to, set, to just challenge everyone on this call to, uh, just, to just stop and just, just take a moment to consider learning more, to engaging, to, to uh, attending events just like this one that we've had today, um, to just taking you know, one moment, two moments, as, as much time as you need to, to think about the role that you're playing and how your influence is, is um, projecting on others. Um, I feel that you're either being influenced or you're an influencer. And so how are you taking your influence from others and you know, what, what's, what are you producing from that influence? Beyond race, we could have a conversation on, on gender equity. There's, there's no doubt. We could have conversations on equity across um, religion and, and, and lots of lots of, of statuses that we we would claim. But my husband, Coach uh, Tim Boyd, that's here on the call, is, is a special educator. And I've learned just as much about inclusion and diversity from him in his role as a special educator and his advocate for those that may not be able to advocate for themselves as I have from anyone regarding any other situation. So I would just like for, for everyone to take a moment and just pause and think about how you can grow in, in the, the process of influence in your particular role. Call to action. For coaches, honor representation for colleagues and athletes. Be a voice for the value of diversity and promote unity among those you influence, including athletes, colleagues, and aspiring coaches. For administrators, hire more minority coaches, embrace diversity, and push for unity. For fans, spectators, or students, embrace efforts toward unity displayed by teams and programs. For student athletes, use your platform to help diversify playing fields, demonstrate unity. So now it is time for our question and answer segment. Please use the chat function to send questions to our panelists. Please do not unmute so that questions can be addressed adequately. Take a few minutes just for you to type in your question and Jay and I will take turns reading those questions and any of the panelists, unless it's specified to a particular panelist. Uh, can respond. While we are waiting, I actually have a question and it will be for any panelists who would like to answer. Um, so as I stated earlier in my introduction, I am an assistant basketball coach at Rock Hill High School. And I feel that a lot of times while I feel that I have a place of uh, representation for our athletes, I know that I took maybe what is considered a non-traditional route to coaching as in I did not have a collegiate career. So how do I um, continue to show my love for the game, my uh, personal, I guess not my personality, but I can't find the word that I'm looking for, but my, my position as someone who has continuously studied the game um, since my time donning a jersey um, to continue to show athletes that there's not necessarily always going to be that next level, that next step. But if you have a passion for something, you can continue to uh, make a difference in the lives of those behind you. 
I think you hit it on the head. I think the word is passion. Um, I think passion is what some people just have. It's, it's innate in them. And if you show passion, people follow that. Uh, I know that, you know, the kids, they love a coach that's passionate, that cares about them as humans. And, and that's how you buy in first with the love. And then, you know, with whatever you're coaching in basketball. So you show that passion for them as people. Um, they'll buy into you and then they'll do anything you need um, on the court. So keep the passion alive. Um, love on them, as you guys would say in the South. <laughs> Give them all the love, and then um, they'll buy into you um, on the court, and, and then just be the best you coach you can be. Keep studying the game if you didn't play. Keep studying. Um, use your contacts, um, and, and you'll be on your way. Keep the passion, baby. Yeah, I'd like to add to that. I think, um, you know, I, I played uh, Division One and, and had a shot at the NFL. And I think that has nothing to do with me as a coach. Um, I, I think sometimes it can give you a perspective. And I think sometimes kids like to hear that you did something. Um, but there are a ton of great athletes that are not good coaches. Um, and, and coaching is teaching. Um, and it's just a totally different ball game when it comes to uh, relationships uh, when it comes to taking somebody that doesn't know anything. I mean, you're coaching high school basketball, so you're getting kids um, that don't have a clue at times. Um, and, and you're building that foundation where another college coach is getting athletes that do have a clue. Um, so there's different things as far as levels that come with uh, coaching and uh, that, that make it challenging regardless of what level you're on. Um, but uh, ultimately, man, passion, people know when you're passionate about them and when you're passionate about learning and improving. Uh, and as long as you're pushing to be the best you can be and uh, man, we're big on, we will call anybody. If we meet you and you, we feel like you might know something that we don't, we're going to call you till you finally give us the goods. Um, and so being aggressive and learning um, can allow you, I've built a lot of relationships from just asking like, Hey, how do y'all do this? Um, and, and finally that I get an answer. Um, and then from there, I build a relationship. And, um, and so um, being passionate and, and being aggressive and being the best you can be um, and doing it for the service of others will allow you to, uh, to really, really improve. Because kids, when, they, when you love them and they, you care about them, they could give a darn what your background is. Um, they just know they can count on you. So our first question from the chat reads, what resources would you suggest for coaches as well as everyone else to access to continue further education on diversity and to continue engaging with the topic and discussing it to others? And I have noticed Dr. Renee has put in the chat, there are so many books and podcasts to assist. And she said she suggested 1619 as a podcast. Um, and so you want to talk about race as a book. Um, our next question reads, when starting a new job or when you begin to coach a new group of athletes, what is the best way to build a relationship? And in the sake of time, we'll ask probably just one panelist for the next couple questions, just to be respectful of everyone. Uh, I was going to take this one. Um, so for me, like I said, I, I get to know them outside of the sport. Like you're so much more to me than just basketball, both football, whatever the case may be. So whether it's a song, like maybe, you know, like I'll talk to them and be like, what you know about this, right? Like it just kind of depends, you know, like, and I'll be like, you don't know nothing about this song, you know? And that, at that point, start a little bit of jokes there, kind of gets them going a little bit. And it's like, all right, you know, that's Coach Smith. And then after practice, so what if not basketball? I love to ask that question. What if not this sport, right? So what else are you interested in? And then start to hear their flow and then kind of just ask them a little bit more outside of their sport. Um, and then at that point, the relationship is built and then they're coming to you and they're trusting you in different ways uh, about life situations, class situations, and, you know, just kind of letting them know, like I said, you're there for them. Like once an athlete knows that you care, they'll run through a wall for you. They don't know why they running through the wall, but Coach Smith cares for them and they're going to run through the wall. So they, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And the care, that part, I've, I've held on to that one pretty strong as I'm starting this career. It's like, like, he, like, you know, like Coach said, 
they know they can feel it when you care for them. And once that's been established, that relationship's there forever. A coach will influence more lives in a year than most people will ever will in their life. So just making sure that you're doing the right thing when you are talking to them. I think that's a great response, Coach Smith. Uh, thank you for that. And that really helped to touch on um, the other question, the next question of how do you continue the conversation with your athletes? So we'll continue. We'll take one more question um, unless we have a, a little time after that. So what are some aspects other than a great resume would be best for putting yourself into your field? So anybody want to take a shot at that question? I'd like to. Um, I, 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 I will go down saying this um, until somebody tells me different, shows me different. The best way um, to improve your craft is to get in the craft. And a lot of times that's gonna be volunteering. Um, man, find a way to help in the environment or, or job that you want for free um, and use that opportunity to learn as much as you can and build the relationships. And I mean, uh, and, and Coach Smith just talked about how to build relationships. It's just being genuine, finding out who, who are you? You know what I mean? And how can I serve you and help you? Uh, and, and people, Everybody understands that and everybody's attracted to someone that's willing to serve. Um, but man, just get in there. It could be high school level, college level, uh, free help um, in doing something will kind of give you the doorway to start expanding your knowledge and gaining opportunities. Um, and, and the best hire is a lot of times the hire of someone you already know. You know what they're going to do. They've proved that they're, they're, they're there for you. They're going to work hard. Um, and, and, and now there's an opportunity. And we can just slide you right on in. And sometimes that's a, a great fit. And many people have built great careers off of um, being at the bottom. Real, real quick, my undergrads, I just want to say uh, I'm not that far removed from you guys. And it's, it's all about who you know here. Like, it, you know, they say it's what you know, what you know matters. Don't get me wrong. Like what you know matters, but it's definitely a field of who, you know. So, uh, I mean, if it were me in this position and there's someone in this chat that touched your heart, I would have been emailing them, getting their contact information and talking to them, if not later on today, but tomorrow morning, you know, and that, that's how I began to make my footprint in this field. And it's shown to take me far. So like, if there's somebody in this chat that you feel like said something to you, get their contact information and message them now. Be genuine, you know, don't be fake about it. You know, don't do that, but be genuine, message them about it and see where it takes you. I'd love to jump in on what Taylor just said. When she said, be genuine and be authentic, pay attention to that. So that makes the line, it's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's also about who you know, but it's also about who knows you. And for you to be known, you gotta be you, not who you think you're supposed to be, you gotta be you. That's such an important piece as you grow your network. So we hate to cut the question and answer portion short, but we do want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, on behalf of myself and Dr. Boy, I would like to say thank you for all of those who have joined us today. We hope that you gain a lot of insight and you have something that you not only heard, but you listened to and you're able to carry out into your various professions. We would also like to send a big thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you for your insight, for your time, and for your willingness to work with us and be here with us during this conversation. Dr. Boyd has dropped the evaluation in the chat. So please, um, everyone, if you can and will, please remember to uh, or take the time to fill that out. It should not take you very long, um, 10 minutes max, if that. Um, but please give us your true and honest opinion. We want to make sure that this was valuable, um, regardless of if it was for my independent study or not. It is something that I am passionate about as an aspiring coach myself. So it will be, really mean a lot to me if you will all will take the time to be truthful um, in your honest, I mean, honest in your answers. Dr. Boyd, do you have any closing thoughts? Just want to say thank you again to the panelists. This is how important this conversation is to our panelists. Coach Tinsley and Coach Boyd have a game this afternoon. So they are taking time out of game day to, to have a very important discussion with us. So thank you, Coach Tinsley and Coach Boyd. Thank you, Coach Cameron. Thank you, Coach Smith, Dr. Halpin, and Dr. Renee and Miss Reed. We really appreciate your time and your expertise.
Also, panelists, um, if you do not mind and you would like to drop any contact information, um, that is appropriate as well if you feel, um, you know, if you would like to do so. And uh, attendees, you can also email um, um, Jay or I, and uh, if you're looking to reach out to make contacts as well. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. It's spectacular work, LeJay. Great job. Thank you, Dr. Halpern. Thank you. Panelists, if you can gone for just a minute for a debrief, we can do that. Good job, Jay. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, great job, LeJay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Boyd, would you like me to 